Hello, everyone. My voice is very crackly, so I'm sorry about that. Um, welcome to our lecture series tonight. Uh, before we begin, uh, my name is Frank Rock. I'm the Associate Dean of the School of Architecture and Design. Uh, dean Judith DeMille wanted to send her, her note to you that she couldn't make it last minute. She got tied up in something, so. Uh, I want to remind everyone to turn off their cell phones, and if anybody needs AIA credits, we have a form at the top of the stairs. Uh, this is our first lecture this fall. Um, tonight we have Lucy Boulevant, and tomorrow night we're going to have Calvin Sow over at Steelcase. That'll take place at 6.30. On Thursday we're having TEDx NYIT. That's a whole day event starting at 9 a.m. On Thursday, October 17th, we have Low Tech at the DeSaversky Mansion in Old Westbury. That takes place at 6.30. And on Thursday, November 14th, we have Susanna Drake, which will take place right here at the auditorium on Broadway. So once again tonight, it is our distinct pleasure to have Lucy Bullivant with us. Lucy Bullivant is an architecture and design curator, critic, author, and advisor. She was born in London to architect parents who installed a passion in her for, for this profession. Maybe that's a curse to architects as parents. Over the years, she has consistently advocated for higher design standards and experienced and experimental multidisciplinary strategies to help counter the negative effects of globalization. A cultural historian with a master's degree from the Royal College of Art, she initially worked as an art curator and director of open art exhibitions. She launched her own company, Lucy Boulevant and Associates, in 1984, working internationally with leading museums, galleries, cultural institutions, publishers, and corporate bodies. Lucy was elected an honorary fellow of the RIBA, which is the Royal Institute of British Architects, in 2010. She's also an adjunct professor, professor, urban design history and theory at Syracuse University in London, not New York. In 2010, she founded urbanista.org, responding to contemporary social, cultural, and political patterns of urban design. She was formerly the Heinz Curator of Architecture, the Royal Academy of Arts, and has curated exhibitions for Vitra Design Museum, Triennio, Triennio di Milano, and the British Council. Her conferences have been staged at Tate Modern, the ICA, the Architectural Association, and at the Strelka Institute in Moscow. She is a curator and chair of the VNA's Talking Architectural Series and co-curator of the Urbanista slash Recode Gallery series of talks at Lime Wharf Futures Gallery in London. Lucy is a correspondent to Domus, The Plan, Architectural Review, Architecture Today, and volume and in design. In addition, she has authored eight books on contemporary architecture and urban design, including the most recent, which I think she's going to talk about tonight, Master Planning Futures. Please join me in welcoming Lucy Boulevard, FRIBA. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. It's a real pleasure to be here at NYIT. Um, I've got a rather imposing title up there on the screen, and um, I'd like to say, first of all, that I hope, irrespective of which discipline you, you come from, that you'll be able to take something from what I say tonight, because um, master planning, it's a kind of a loaded word, and master planning, well, everybody seems to have a master plan today. You're, uh, it doesn't really matter what discipline you are. If you're in management science or you're a politician, um, you're in the military, yeah, you have a master plan. So in a, in a way, there's actually a, some, a lot of mystery surrounding the term, and it's also one that's very historical. So I uh, responded to Routledge, the publishers in the UK, to um, a kind of cry to fill a hole in the market, a real gap in the market for a book about contemporary master planning, uh, whether it's master planning, framework planning, uh, area action plans, you name it. In, in a way, they all, all these different terminologies, they all converge into, into one overall uh, concept, which is the very nature of 
um, making a plan that will actually uh, influence change in cities, in urban areas, or, or what I call, or other people call, peri-urban areas, which are basically uh, somehow semi-rural semi or somehow on the periphery of cities. So this is the book, and I, I shamelessly plug it, of course, because I'm going to basically tell you a whole series of related stories to give you an insight into, uh, into really how I approach the whole book. So um, here's a little slide about the copyright. <laughs> Um, here's the image. Okay, so I'm going to be plunging back into history a, a little bit and then coming back to the present because that tends to be the way that I work. Um, in order to not be try and, try and be comprehensive, but in order to really give you some insights into the way in which people's thinking about master planning and moreover adaptive planning, which I argue is, is really what we need today. Um, can, can be of great use. So um, throughout history, it's fair to say that urban planning and socio-political strategies have been really closely connected. Whether you think about the Neoplatonic Rena Renaissance city or the house monization of Paris, um, and the caption below this image shows you, it indicates to you what Baron Haussmann's motives would have been with his red pen for the city of Paris way back in, in, uh, in the, uh, the 19th century. Um, or another example that you know so well because it's the lived reality of New York City, the equal potential structure of the grid. Um, master planning as a practice in the 20th century though by contrast diffused globally by lots of different mechanisms, including, um, going back in time, colonialism, adhered to very specific identity in relation to society. Um, planning, through the creation of land use maps, through zoning, density controls, building regulations, and planning standards, it was seen as a, an exercise in the, in the physical planning and design of human settlements operating through a rigorous administrative structure with social, economic, and political matters and apparently lying somewhat outside its scope, although I think it, what was actually really going on, I mean, this slide gives you an indication that there's always an agenda, whether it's covert or overt. So in terms of definition of process, it was a technical activity carried out by tra only by trained experts with relatively little or no involvement by politicians, certainly really not by communities. It was decidedly top-down. So um, the, the chief development tool, the master plan in the 20th century, um, uh, in, in terms of conventional use, it was really has been in the past to carry out a f straightforward area ratio based parceling up of land, um, a purely uh, top down rigid division of space, uh, the one that abstracted the green field, actually banished the green field from the city completely, or, or certainly and certainly killed off any notion of the public street. And it is true, if you read Le Corbusier, he, he wasn't in favor of public streets. Um, and all of this was in service of a totalizing vision, a totalizing abstract vision. So things have moved on a pace since that time. And now in the, in the um, 21st century, in the second decade already of the 21st century, there is still an equivalent form of aspiring colonization in the form of so-called smart city developments, like the very hard-bordered Mazdar city in Abu Dhabi, which uh, Norman Foster and partners have been responsible for, and the phase one of it has, has, has already been finished, and it's, being, it's a real um, magnet of all politicians seeking a kind of photo opportunity. <laughs> so they want to be associated with sustainable futures, because it's very, very smart in, in their view. Um, and another example on, an, on, on another end of the scale would be in, in, on the outskirts of Moscow, the Skolkovo Innovation Technology Center, which is actually a rare example in um, Russia, 
of a new master plan, a new genre of master plan. Another example would be in Perm, which is a long way away from Moscow, which is a plan that's being uh, made by the Dutch master planner Case Christian, say, for some, a very, very young, progressive group of, um, of clients who are convinced uh, that, that they have the right idea. Um, and Skolkovo is a, is a mixed-use project with parks and pleasure grounds, and, uh, and it uses both green and brownfield sites, which is quite significant. And it breaks all the, breaks all the conventional uh, sort of norms of master planning in quite a refreshing way. But it is still, uh, uh, it is still a business district, that's for sure. And um, probably some of you may have heard of the American academic Keller Easterling, who has a book coming out imminently with Princeton Architecture Press called Extra Statecraft which will, in fact, um, pick up on this whole issue of the, the very hard-bordered um, business district zone activity, which is quite apparently proliferating around the world. She's done the in-depth research on that. So um, we are now in a situation where cities, if not regions, have become far more concerned with future-proofing their existences um, amidst what many people call uh, casino capitalism, um, amidst climate change and, and all the manifestations that we've experienced in the last um, few years going back over more than a decade and uh, resulting ecological trauma and so on. And um, one big formula that has emerged is the long-term citywide plan and New York City has plan NYC uh, Abu Dhabi has Abu Dhabi 2050, which is to uh, move its dependency away from oil into much more sustainable uh, energy futures based on their concept of sustainability, which is Estidama in Arabic. Um, and we have in the States the framework plan generally often, and in the Netherlands, where they have a lot of framework plans, it's a menu. It's basically we want everything on that menu. So 10 big moves, they actually all complement each other beautifully. And, uh, and whether or not all of these become possible all at the same time, the very fact that people sit around a table and consult the general public moreover and come up with a consensus that these are the abiding principles, these are the things that are non-negotiable, these basically represent our value systems. And that, to me, is what a, a good master plan today has to be based around. Um, the other uh, big body, which I believe is still going strong, is America 2050, which is doing a lot of research. And then that's another feature of the framework plan, that it's very much based on fresh research into um, demographics now, not using the old, tired research of the past. Um, which may be used in a way that is based on assumptions and then, then there's an agenda and then it all becomes very kind of meta-meta distorted view of what people really, really need. So, um, so, um, queremos una solución urgente. Um, the whole issue of uh, the fact that we need a solution very soon, does that beg the question then, do we need a master plan? Do we need to go very, really fast. What should we do? Um, the combined impacts of economic and ecological crisis on top of migration, migratory uh, trajectories in populations and a whole myriad of social inequalities um, in the wake also of the current era of escalations in scales of cities into mega metropolises, it's bringing particular sets of tensions. Um, here is um, Chengdu in China, a very lovely photograph by a colleague of mine at ETH in Zurich. Uh, and he and his students did a lot of fresh research on the city around the same time that I did. And on my web scene, urbanista.org, you can read an article about it. And then I discovered the other day another friend has been doing research there and also master plan there. So somehow we have a Chengdu series going on. And I really do like that opportunity to track 
what's happening in particular c cities over a period of time to, to actually detect uh, cha change. So um, the urban, urban um, think tank, um, in fact, they're the name, the urban think tank are the professors at ETH. So they did their studies, and in 1980, um, Chengdu had 2 million inhabitants. Today it's got 14 million inhabitants, and they estimate 30 million inhabitants by 2042. So the students proposed bottom-up areas, um, including agriculture, for uh, this m a mass migration of farmers uh, who are being given government incentives to relocate from outside the city and basically change the whole way of life. The idea being that these would be uh, uh, right next to more obviously top-down areas, and the image on the on the right on the left hand side is distinctly top down there'll be one of the biggest entertainment centers in the whole world which is on site designed by Zaha Hadid architects and um, whatever was there before is completely uh, reduced to tabula rasa um, so their idea was that value the value of differentiated space through qualitative not quantitative approach was really really important so they also make uh, some connections with um, situations in other Far Eastern cities and say that the mix of challenges that they've detected, including social disparity, labor exploitation, issues of political fre freedom above all, they urgently demand that urban designers understand the ecosystems of cities in a more complex way and grasp credible political, uh, potential means to respond to them that they need to be capable of advanced socio-spatial readings of the layers of urban environments, detecting relationships and potentials lying both in practical actualities and the potential of existing civic cultures. So that does mean thinking in a far more sociological way, but also, I argue, in a deeply critical and activist way. And Louis Kahn, the architect, American architect, was probably right to be a bit skeptical of sociologists when he said back in the 60s that he wasn't really sure about anyone who talked in terms of 2.5 people, um, which was a statement that Denise Scott Brown, the American architect, oh, actually, sorry, she's South African, her, her partner Robert Ventura is American, quoted uh, Kahn as saying in her 2004 book, Architecture as Signs and Systems for a Mannerist Time. So um, today what I want to do is just look at the benefits of various progressive planning stra strategies in a variety of s uh, settings. The first thing that I would say is that they really do need to be custom designed for their context. I really don't believe in cut and paste, cookie cutter urbanism. Solutions need to be individual and they need to be based on deep readings as well as, uh, as part of the process of ide identifying which operational tools uh, of design are the, are the best ones for that context. And when it comes to sustainable resilient plans, and the city has had a big, big de debate about resiliency, and NYIT will have its TED Talks on resilience, resilience on Thursday, the same thing applies. Uh, um, no one single mitigation or adaptation policy is equally well suited to all cities. Uh, as Juan Clos, the executive director of UN Habitat, wrote in, the, in that organization's publication, Cities and Climate Change, Global Report on Human Settlements, published in 2011. So um, big plans seem to be very much in vogue. Uh, some people shy away from them, but I think that that level of ambition is really, really important to try to figure out connectivities and relationships. Um, the o OMA scheme has not gone ahead, and in fact, a lot, of, uh, a lot of master planners, more speculative projects have been put on hold in the eco economic crisis, but uh, the very nature of the investigation is, is of huge value. Um, 55 acre plan of Cartel Pendic that Zaha Hadid Architects has been working on for some years on the Asian side of Istanbul in Turkey. 
and they've been r really grappling with the fact that there are all these Byzantine multiple land ownership issues that also have to be negotiated. So, and that's really until you actually have a, a sequence of pieces of land together that, are, that you can actually do phase one on, you, you're not going to get very far. So there is the question then, can BIG also be site responsive? Meanwhile, the agency uh, in, in, in social terms of small-scale in interventions is, has a huge value. Um, this plan by Superpool Architects, young practice in Istanbul, to rescue the city's street as open public space, rescue it from invasion by the increasing numbers of cars that uh, people love to park all over the spaces that people also like to use um, outside where they live. So this, the challenges that cities and regions are facing demand that we advance with recourse neither to the purely top-down aspirations that ruled in the past, nor to uh, and prevail in the present, as I made clear, on many different continents, nor solely to bottom-up thinking, which is emerging today. And, and you have to argue whether bottom-up thinking alone has the, the sufficient agency to, to get things done. We need a dynamic relationship and an equilibrium between both. And a contemporary master plan can only be of use if it engages with the concept of uh, urban order expressed as dynamic interdependencies between evolving conditions and systems, becoming in the process a mediatory in instrument, something that mediates between mixed um, between fixed and flexible outcomes. Um, there's there's a, an urban designer, biologist, and sociologist um, back further back in the 20th century who's Scottish, Sir Patrick Geddes. There are a couple of very nice books about him. And uh, he, he said, new forceful instruments for handling what concerns us all most, namely survival, are basically what is important. And uh, that's a kind of timeless thing that still applies now as much, and if more so now than ever before. So I'm going to look at a variety of plans, some far more adaptive than others, and include a focus on some of the more bottom-up thinking. Um, and as you can imagine, some of these stories go back. So I'll give you a few highlights and some points of strategy as tasters. Um, another. A key point that I make in the book is that plans in the developed world can meaningfully take some of their cues from work being done in the developing world in the global south. Um, an urban think tank who have uh, done a lot of work at Columbia have probably given lectures many times in New York and made this very point themselves. And within a city, the relationship between the scale of the formal city and the informal is very important to grasp through three through research because they're interlinked systems. As the, uh, the uh, sociologist Saskia Sassen uh, has pointed out in a number of her books. So there are serious issues of social inequality and exclusion that plans, um, very well-known plans like the one for Medellin in Colombia, Alejandro Echeverri, who's given a lot of lectures over the last few years, it's had a lot of media coverage, including in the, the more sort of national media, not only in specialist press. Um, and they tried to address the, um, the issues I'm here looking at. Oh, we have Christopher Wren. I'll go back to him in a second. Um, but um, trying to address basically an integrated mix of measures, including library, the, introducing the concept to the program of the library park and, and schools for the barrios, social housing and transformation to streets, a cable, uh, cable uh, car transport system, connecting the formal and the informal city and breaking down the, breaking down the frontier that previously existed. Uh, and actually the process of envis envisioning workshops to find new ways to improve neighborhoods um, in Medellin began in the early 1990s in the local university, directly consulting slum dwellers, bringing together elderly people, children, mothers and fathers, community leaders, 
and the former milit milit militiamen of the barriers who left their machine guns on, you know, outside and came in and um, just got down serious conversation. Um, and, uh, but always with local workers employed uh, on different initiatives and always with a high level of technical support on hand so that the plan's feasibilities could immediately be explored and developed instead of basically you have one big great discussion and then the thing goes on hold and then some months later somebody does a technical study. It was all uh, very, very in, uh, aspirationally an aspiration for integrated thinking. Now somewhere we've got Christ Christopher Wren popping up here. Christopher Wren, of course, is a famous British architect and he somehow has appeared in here in a strange place. <laughs> But he must have, there must be a very logical reason. Now, the point that I wanted to make about Christopher Wren is that um, the, um, the plan that he made for the rebuilding of London after the Great Fire of, 19, of, of 1666, um, the question of, it, it's relevant now, because the question of getting financial leverage and equity for any kind of plan, it's, it's greatly impacted by the quality and the specific value of the plan. But if the money is not there, then what can you do? So big thinking can't be implemented with a lack of budget. It can still be scaled down. There is a merit in the discursive process of the master plan. Uh, it can be scaled down to some initiatives that actually in the end have quite radical effects. So his client, King Charles II, uh, together they just couldn't implement it, there wasn't the money, and they didn't own the land either, so what did they do? But they did manage in the end to ma widen a lot of the very, very small uh, streets. And also they brought around about this new system of planning permissions to encourage the owners of buildings to create proper street frontages. Their facades were strangely full of um, windows and there were all manner of um, household waste, as you can imagine in that time, leaked down, leaked out over the windows and onto the pavements. So this very measure to actually, um, probably they had some penalty if you, you, you still were guilty of this, um, creating proper street frontages, and thereby the streets became uh, re reimagined as places where you know given a new a new um, a new task, a new a new respect a dignity to them that maybe they didn't have before. So um, going back to the whole thread of my other argument about. Um, Um, what you do when you have a disaster and you really need to, to get, get moving on something. Um, I'm just looking for the right sheet here. Uh, Constitucioni, yes, in Chile. Now, uh, um, Alejandro, not Alejandro, uh, Aravena, who's the director of uh, Elemental in Santiago. Um, this issue of time is important because fast-track fast plans um, some people have the view, take the view that fast track is not possible. I do remember that one of the clients at Make It Right in New Orleans saying, we didn't do a master plan for Make It Right. We didn't have the luxury. We needed to respond really quickly. Um, now, that, that may or may not have been the case in that context, but um, Elemental agreed that within 100 days they would make alliances between the stakeholders and they were very lucky because who stepped up to the plate immediately in the aftermath of the uh, earthquake and tsunami um, in Constitucione, which is the second city uh, in Chile, 350 kilometers south of Santiago. But Arauco, which is the biggest wood pulp producer in the whole country, who had they had some of their ma manufacturing plants along the coast, which is where Constitucion Constitucion is. Um, so they had to do all the alliances, get everyone on board, do the research, find out from the whole community what was really needed, uh, and conceive on a multidisciplinary basis what they were going to do, and do public consultation through an exhibition, uh, weekly workshops, and then um, 
and then arrange um, a public vote on whether it went ahead. Come up with um, uh, d designs for all aspects of the of the city: um, new schools, new housing, new new fire station, um, a whole range of public buildings, and um, and they made it. And the housing is going ahead, and. Uh, the community was involved every step of the way and everything was, they were allowed to speak and everything was taped and, uh, and they voted it in. But they did have a vote in the first place and then they made, some film director made a film about it as well. So there seems to me to be an ideal way of proceeding um, in, in, in a number of different, uh, it, as a way of dealing with a lot of different um, disasters and unexpected things happening. So we need, we need that capacity for adaptive and design-led strategic thinking in, in different timescales to really exercise, our, our, um, exercise all our skills um, about how a variety of longer and shorter term challenges can be met in a more diversified and incremental and socially equitable way. So I... Um, there's the voting. Um, I'm going to flag up briefly some themes that have cropped up in master planning over the last 50 years or so and explain how I think there have been attempts to build on the potentials of these earlier plans. Now, the British architect Alison Smithson um, wrote in um, a publication uh, by Team 10, the, the group that she was a member of, in 1962. This is one year after Jane Jacobs wrote her famous book, The, death and, the Life and uh, Death of Famous of American Cities. Um, and she wrote, no abstract master plan stands between the architect and what he has to do, only the human facts and the logistics of the situation. Human facts and the logistics of the situation well, I mean, you could say facts are facts, but when it comes down to it, all of that has to be figured out. Um, and that is actually a huge amount. So there's no argument for abstraction in, in the face of that. And I think that's what she really, really sensed. Um, and it was a time anyway in the early 60s when the limits of the belief that every problem has to have a physical solution alone became, came to be questioned and a responsiveness to social patterns and needs grew. Um, and moreover, and figures like Louis Kahn, for example, talked of looking deep into a problem and evolving a design system from within, uh, rather than imposing it from above. But now, as then, master plans laying out the basic parameters before the buildings are commissioned, mostly by other architects, they still have a tendency to be abstract, especially as they are often based on outdated demographic data or on simplistic notions of density, or they demote the quality of street life in favor of ma maximizing marketable letting space that they can be fast track, which is not of itself a liability, but it is when, as is often the case, the fast track project um, adheres to old planning ideas alone, rather than being driven by a more holistic sense of cultural agency. So now, 50 years later from um, some of these, uh, this early dialogue and um, ideas. Master plans really have to respond generously to the innate presence of cultural dis difference found in cities and regions. So Brasilia, um, well we know historically that adaptive planning principles have not been applied and although numerous very fine formally realized plans like Brasilia have shaped urban identities at a very profound level, uh, Lucho Costa's plan from 1956 for the capital of Brazil was bought, built in only four years, and it celebrated its 50th anniversary in 2010. But while its individual buildings by Oscar Niemeyer are greatly admired, and uh, it is a real um, destination as a place for all kinds of reasons, its barren public spaces are, are not. Um, they're, they're arid and they have very little shade. And um, the low-density, heavily planted, late-modernist city of Chandigarh in the Punjab 
of in India, which is the first post-colonial um, modern city to be built from scratch in, in India, um, which is a vision of Corbusier's. It's been widely acclaimed, but it's now fast becoming a global hub of IT services, and it's, it's got a lot of unplanned as well as planned urbanization. And it's a case study in what you do when um, you know, such a treasured historic plan um, somehow becomes subject to all sorts of different changes, population growth and changes in industry structure and so on, traffic congestion and environmental pollution is rife. And so the, the two satellite towns of um, Panchula and Mohali are absor absorbing a lot of the population and industry growth. And they're maintaining Chandigarh's sector-based structure, um, which you can see if you look at the plan of the city in their own developments. But they've, they've shed the original ordinances that Corbusier designed, and the streets have become quite, quite mixed use. Um, and there, there have been teams from academia, so Technical University in Berlin carried out a study called Update Chandigarh, and they concluded it needed a much better relationship with its peripheral edges and to the region overall, which is a feature of exurban growth mirrored by a lot of cities in the US and, and many other places too. And then the uh, University of Washington's Chandigarh lab uh, is studying the new master plan which is being forged in response to these pressures, considering how, uh, how growth can be compactly related to infrastructural developments like bus rapid transit rather than occurring in a very ad hoc, just an ad hoc way in peripheral areas. So after Chandigarh was built, a whole new relationship between the whole and its parts um, began to emerge in master plans, um, which is strongly discernible in the Japanese architect Kenzo Tangi's 1960 plan for Tokyo, which was made after very in-depth research into demographics and economics in the location which imposed a whole a new physical order in order to accommodate expansion and internal regeneration through a linear series of interlocking uh, loops expanding the city across the whole of Tokyo, Tokyo Bay. And it incorporated concepts of mobility, urban structure, a linear, the linear urban, linear civic uh, axis, and the notion of the city as an organic pr process, which hadn't been seen so much before. And the plan was considered very beneficially different from other early approaches, abandoning the zoning of modernism um, in order to have an open complex, complex linked by a communication network. And metabolist in spirit, it, uh, uh, as a denotation of human vitality, it demonstrated the scope of what Team 10 uh, called the aesthetics of change to replace the traditional Cartesian aesthetics, uh, aesthetic in design. So in that sense, it really was groundbreaking. Now, uh, just coming up to the present day, one example in Europe, um, Berlin's Potsdamer Platz, six and a half million square feet feet's worth of it, um, was once a wasteland right next to where the, the wall was. And in the 1920s and 30s, the, it was the busiest transport hub in the whole of Europe, as iconic as um, Times Square in New York. And it was brought back into life after German reunification. And, and in part, it was redeveloped for Daimler-Benz, the German car company, to a master plan by Renzo Piano in 1992. So uh, just um, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, adapting the original plan that was made by Schinkel as a very dense urban quarter with um, buildings by six other architects. And it was at the time criticized quite heavily in some quarters by being more enclavist, like a city within a city. Also for the blandness of its corporate architecture which may or may not be the case, but, um, but above all for its failure to blend into the surrounding older neighborhoods that overlook it. So it's now, in a way, it's a little bit 21 years old. It's a little bit of um, period peace now, but, um, and that it, it happened the way that it happened. 
But the very fact that it happened, I think, perhaps encouraged people to somehow try to stay clear of doing things in quite that way again within Berlin. Although I noticed when I was in Berlin a few weeks ago that there were a number of um, rather kind of um, rather high new uh, shopping quarters being realized, in fact, almost as if the economic crisis wasn't happening. Um, but there's a lot of things happening at the moment. We do live in interesting times. And um, now we can really see the emergence in some areas of bottom-up urbanism, a range of phenomena, including participatory design, democratic processes in the use of new technologies and related social media now drive public participation, while at the same time the framework of, of frameworks of regulations on which many eco eco-cities are based, actually prevents sustainable concepts being realized. So in a number of um, contexts globally, it has to be said that the conscious practice of conceptual master planning and adaptive planning is limited. And often master planning involves social, uh, social and economic research. Um, it's also weak and lacking in rigorous consultation with citizens as a marketing-led vision of the city as product. Uh, dominates. But there are um, growing mindsets towards the making of the city which are much more about self-generated and the whole notion of the, cust the customization of, of the knowledge and the information that we ourselves gather and, uh, and use for different, different means. Um, collected data that we, we draw on in an intelligent way, spatial analysis and mapping in the context of a potential open data culture. I know that's highly, uh, it's highly challenging at the same time, and it's an area of a whole different lecture as well. But this approach goes with the grain and the DNA of cities, I think, and it creates economic, environmental, and social value. So ICT now has to be part of master planning and bringing in many instances virtual education and healthcare solutions. Um, and the market has given the lead. Uh, IBM's data center in Rio, which was set up in 2010 after the floods, um, can be used for monitoring any event in the city, building up the capacity to respond in a, a timely way. And since the public private alliances of stakeholders who commission master plans are needed. We, um, we've had a, a, a real um, uh, shrinking of the power of the public sector in the UK um, because there are a lot of redundancies in local government. But I think ultimately the people in the UK who are the, the, the setup that creates the most resilient master plans is one where the private developer is working uh, in, a, in alliance with the local government. Somebody is steering somebody else, and uh, they somehow give each other uh, courage. Ideally, that's, that's the ideal scenario. Um, the other fact is that I think a lot of local and civ civic municipalities um, do not actually know themselves how to design social media. And that's a hindrance. But I mean, whether other third parties and urban designers themselves can apply new technologies in this way, in a way that somehow makes up for that deficit, that is a question to throw out. Anyway, so at the moment, there's a growing interest in the bottom-up adaptive planning, planning, but the top-down still dominates. And it's bonded to the illusion of neutral met metrics that uh, the facts and figures that you use can be applied in a way which is somehow very rational and you don't need to ally that with more of an instinct, which a uh, gut feeling about places. I think that's misguided. Um, today, I think that we need to achieve cross-scalar so social ecological resilience through adaptive systems. We need relational urbanism that matches the way that we conceive of nature right now, which is surely shifted from the, the tree of life to the web of life, um, with all these phenomena like nested systems, food webs, ecosystems, relation browsers, cloud computing, and distributed energy systems, for example. And is this so far away from what the um, American uh, 
American um, urban historian, Lewis Mumford, advocated with his notion of biotechnics, um, which if you read his books, it indicates the notion of something that's self-regulating, self-correcting, aiming for balance, aiming for wholeness. I don't think that it necessarily is. Um, we can't really ask him because he's not around, but um, it, it, there are some of the urban historians from the early part of the 20th century, I think in their comments were remarkably prescient about situations that we are still uh, grappling with. So the power of networks. So whether in the developed or the developing world, adaptive planning is an interdependent approach enabling mixed programs rather than the compartmentalization of functions is really vital. And urbanism is seen as inseparable from living systems. Um, landscape is its basic building block and it's an active tissue of a socially nourishing identity. And so the metabolism of each city and uh, urban conurbation and their relationships influenced by today's problems which are both of organized complexity and disorganized complexity they call for a sensibility about the urban space which is uh, to use a medical metaphor homeopathic it's not solely allopathic it's one that's networked distributed localized and situational now we um, you probably all um, come across master plans that are, as I said before, their method of creating brand, uh, city as brand, brand new urban centers, brand new systems of economic development that are spatial, like King Abdullah Economic City, in, uh, which is in planning in Saudi Arabia, or Malibu Town in the IT hub of Gurgaon in India. And the first is very much conceived of as a city, uh, as a product. The latter is more a gated paradise for the, only for the very wealthy. These are not polycentric approaches to the city, but they're much more like enclave, enclave strategies. Um, and schemes are regularly built that actually make no provision for affordable housing. And I come from a city whose population is growing, and it's going to go on growing. And we have the rich getting richer, and we have the most extraordinary uh, new buildings going up, and new new centres of gravity um, being created. And um, the mantra that continues is: we still need to have affordable housing, and it, it's still not being fully addressed in a way that is sustainable. Um, so. It's uh, no surprise that some practitioners actually reject or downgrade master planning as a practice because they don't feel that they want to be creating city as narrow concept as, as um, product. And urban think tank, um, the, the urban designers take that view. Um, they are advocates of urban retrofitting and they, they largely work in the global south um, and they create new facilities within uh, favelas like the vertical gym and um, this is Parisopolis in the uh, favela in Sao Paulo and they do beautiful um, uh, studies of all the aspects of the ecosystem and look at scope for urban agriculture and so on. I mean all of this type of work can be carried out in any context really. It, it, it is as I said applicable to the developed world as well. They, they, would, they, they are quite purists. They say a master plan by, like Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi would not have passed any democratic vote. Um, most plans today are still imposed by boards of corporations so, to, so fast that they are not filtered through democratic processes. But a lot of plans are not procured this way, and the slowdown due to the crisis has really created a valuable space for reflection. And I argue one of the biggest challenges right now is to modify the tr conventional methodologies to shift the ground. Um, even if you do that at the micro level of neighborhoods, it's all, it's all grist to the mill. It's all really, really helpful. And it will bring about meaningful responses to global social economic demands that are felt on a local level, felt at the neighborhood scale. As um, Alejandro Aravena, the 
co-founder of Elemental, who did the Constitucione master plan in Chile after the, the earthquake and tsunami said recently, he said the planner's tools in the conventional sense, they're divorced from the point of the city. What is the point of the city? Well, the city developed as a system when the human mass confronted their differences. But now the reality is that the framework of regulations on which many ecocities are based actually prevents sustainable concepts happening. So they're still grappling with old fashioned uh, rules. Um, well, while in many places, um, master planning involving the social economic research, as I said, is, very, is weak and there, there are not yet the enlightened structures for rigorous public participation. Um, today, planning is, is potentially four-dimensional if you include digital geomap geo space. And, and therefore, we need to have um, self-organizing elements. We need to have scope for self-built housing by citizens, if possible, um, which is something, for example, in my book, in Almiri, the, the city to the east of Amsterdam, where a lot of people have chosen to live because Amsterdam is becoming too expensive, uh, has a grand tradition of uh, quite of innovation in public housing. And there are districts where basically people can buy plots of land and do uh, more or less what they like within certain aesthetic limits, limits and practical limits. Um, and this whole approach requires an ongoing synthesis in the direction of um, a resilient bounding of glo global and local domains, generic and particular relations. So uh, to use a word that's not used very often, there is increased potential for panarchy instead of hierarchy. And panarchy is the framework of nature's rules with the potential for nested systems to be infected by or in contain change. Um, and this thinking influences the identity of urban design and the boundaries of sites. Um, so the elements are less likely to enclose space, but to constitute conductors to use, you know, in the sense of electricity, conductors of exchange between different agencies. So one example um, of a plan where the first phase has been completed, Zaha Hadid Architects Master Plan for One North Singapore. Now this scheme, since it was realized in the first phase, uh, for a very progressive client, JCT Corporation, who was given a, a mandate by the Singaporean government. Um, that really put her practice on the map globally as uh, skilled master planners, and it led open the door for all kinds of uh, master planning commissions. It's a 200 hectare business park. It's being realized in phases. And the, uh, the angle the Singaporean government wanted to explore was the boosting of new economy industries, for example, biomedical research, to have quite a high density so that the researchers and the staff and the ICT specialists and new media producers could, um, could work together quite closely and have a social environment rather than a hermetic one where they would um, bump into each other regularly and stimulate each other through dialogue. And then there would be a community of nearly 140,000 people, not by any means a standard campus, a traditional um, disconnected suburban uh, science park, uh, comp more of a compound in our identity, but one which, as uh, Hadid called, termed it, a complex aggregated urbanistic plan. Um, it is polycentric and it mixes and it layers land use in, in order to maximize the social connections. And it's one that acknowledges and incorporates powerful synergies between urban life and these, these research-driven industries. So it's medium density, but it's got close-knit massing. So it's a range of densities as well, bringing balance and diversity across the site with emphasis on spatial balance and a, an urban amenity. So it reconciles land intensification with quality open space, which is very important. And in develop, being developed in three phases, it integrates industry clusters and their neighborhoods, and it allows them to grow organically without compromising the spatial mix of the site. So the concept is that as innovation in one area fuels ideas in another, new linkages and synergies will, will develop.
So uh, if master plans are a set of tools that bring about urban change, or at least uh, a degree of profound urban speculation in order to open the door to new activities, then they're part of today's re re-evaluation of existing spatial planning and zoning orthodoxies. And if they're to work, they bring flexibility into the process, not wildly, um, you know, wildly um, uh, limitless flexibility, but a, a degree of flexibility that's very desirable. And one example that does this um, in the context of urban remediation is the plan by Ground Lab, the, the uh, they're mixed, um, a mis mixed ethnic background, but their ground lab are based in London, but also in Beijing. Um, and uh, Eduardo Rico and Enriqueta Labres were doing a studio at Harvard G GSD, so they, they teach a lot in the States. Um, their, their thing is relational urbanism. They're, they're very, very insightful. So they, the plan was to regenerate a place called Longgang, which is northeast of Shenzhen in the Pearl River de Delta in China. Um, they feel that landscapes of cities need to be flexible and, ad and adaptable, um, and they need to be, uh, be able to uh, be capable of reconfiguring their environments. So their approach, they argue, re responds to the needs of Chinese cities, which they, as, as they aspire to be planned metropolises and grow exponentially and meet certain targets in terms of economics. They're competing with each other hugely. Um, they also need to test and evaluate urban eco-city models. Um, they can't just keep on doing what they think worked a few years ago. They have to question the norms. Um, so Ground Lab's winning entry for the international design competition for the center of Longgang, it regenerates the urban fabric of, um, for a projected additional population of 350,000 people. What they found was a cluster of very badly connected villages and the river at the heart of the city is separated from these villages. It was regarded by locals as a backwater and a wastewater sewer, which is a very common thing that so many cities have built up. Somehow the river has become degraded and the buildings facing it, they don't face it, they face the other way. This even happened in London, in the city of London, where the buildings were facing, their fronts face the city of London, the economic city, the medieval um, economic center, rather than actually facing the water. It's all a kind of attitude against um, water sides, which of course is really radically changing in the 21st century. So um, Ground Lab's um, whole concept deliberately turns the area into an ecological corridor. So they did a lot of studies of villages and they connect the villages themselves with the local uh, rapid transit and with the river, creating a porosity between the center and the railway, um, and, and allowing scope for small commercial corridors between the villages. So actually looking at where there could be more access points, better circulation patterns, all of which is challenging the traditional opposition that somehow is the common mindset of you have building here and landscape here and there, the twain shall meet. They're somehow antithetical. And I think we, we deserve more than that. And, and Ground Lab, in their comprehensive approach, they managed to introduce a high density program into areas that are currently underused, increasing the overall usage of spa open space and the intensity of social life at street level, which is a very good thing because in there are many, many cities where, where the street level uh, quality is, is dying because whoever designed the overall light layout did not think so well about how to regenerate. I mean, maybe it is something that needs to be subject to constant retrofitting and attention uh, to maintain that. So the, the other beneficial aspect is that it values the urban village, and they um, are not alone in, in doing that. Um, there's another practice called uh, Hawkins Brown in London um, who, they made an exhibition, they, they have a think tank in their office in London called And Also, um, 
where they made an exhibition for the last Venice Architecture Biennale about the identity of the village in China. Um, and what they share is the, they regard the urban village as a key typology which defines both the character and the history of many communities in China because it's got features like street markets, it's got prominent historical buildings, even if they're quite modest and a little bit run down. I mean, they can be repaired. Um, and they found in Longang a whole cluster of villages that they found worthy of preservation. I don't have a lot of pictures of, of, of the built reality that they, they found. I'm just, uh, in a way, focusing on the, the, um, the material that they came up with. But they used all of this as part of their strategy to generate a range of urban characteristics and also introduce a sense of differentiation against us across the site. So in technical terms, what they did was to create a relational urban model which can simultaneously control built mass qual qualities as well as a 3D model of the built fabric based on sets of urban relationships. So changes in different variables for example, in location, in numbers of density nodes, particularities in building catalog and so on, can be added into the design almost in real time in front of the eye, you know, with the clients um, lo looking at the same time, um, making it possible for anyone uh, observing to evaluate the effects of different massing options and spatial arrangements. So that then further discussion on the urban fabric and architectural qualities can be put forward during the decision-making process instead of somehow having a very private dis design process, then going ahead implementing it and then everyone complaining about it afterwards, by which time it's far, far too late for any, any change. Um, or, or it's possible, but it's very expensive. Now, um, talking about landscape, one very interesting aspect of the cultural validity of um, master planning is that a lot of it's so landscape driven and I think it is true with figures like James Corner of field operations and others taking more of a, a urban design stand um, that they are taking on political agency and identity which you didn't necessarily associate with landscape architects before and there's a capacity to reevaluate uh, overlooked urban space as assets for the city, interstitial spaces, neglected areas, um, is really, really important. We have the skills now. We can map and discern the geological, ecological makeup of land through geographic information systems, through the drones that go around working on ecological um, uh, investigations and other hyper-local tools. Um, very speculative project that the former French president, Nicolas Nicolas Sarkozy staged Le Grand Paris, uh, Paris in 2008. It was a competition for 10 invited proposals um, from international multidisciplinary architecture and urbanism teams to diagnose and envision the future of Paris 2030. And it was deeply um, contentious and argued about and in great Parisian style, you know, no one wanted to agree. But some wondered whether his initiative amounted to a decentralization of the Paris region. I mean, it, he got voted out, of course, and now it's Hollande in, as president. So I don't think this would have gone ahead in a big way had it been, had he stayed in government. But there were some really great responses. I think that was the whole point. It was a discussion. Uh, it was a plan for a discussion. The architect Yves Lyon led a team called Descartes. Then they took to all the available urban land in the Paris region, 263 hectares, more than two and a half times the surface area of Paris, they discovered. And in fact, all the teams focused on making the most of underdeveloped areas, particularly around railway tracks and along waterways and on the edges of parks that many other people and maybe developers completely overlook because developers want to go for the best best land um, and one of the other practices tackled government's issues pointing out that greater Paris is the equivalent of 20 mid-sized towns and proposing much more new more sensible territorial divisions um, 
There was another project in Europe that I studied, which I think had a lot has a lot that we can learn from in terms of the relationship between the city, the edge of the city, so the peri-urban and the regional uh, scale and the interface and identity, which was that Milan's municipality in recent years is not at all uh, wealthy and it needs to find ways to actually use its land in a more inte intelligent fashion and actually somehow use it as leverage to, to raise its uh, income, but do that in a way which actually has the support of the citizens. So they, um, Carlo Mazzaroli, who was the deputy mayor, they got his party they got voted out recently, unfortunately, and the whole plan has gone on hold. But he devised um, a fantastic urban development plan um, project which was then led by the architects and urban designers Metrogrammer and taking a very serious look at its post-industrial future. I mean Milan is the city of Fiat, it's the city of all the car industries um, which are, whose uh, production outlets have historically occupied huge great tracts of land and now with them all either scaling down or being uh, relocated elsewhere or some simply changing the level of production. All those tracts of land have to be assigned new identities. So the idea of the UDP, it took its cue from an earlier plan that um, a group of landscape architects literally decided to do on the back of a serviette in a restaurant, no money passing hand, called, they were called land, Italian-German group. Uh, Raggi Verdi, um, green, green Rays, was an environmental strategy they speculatively developed. And it linked I the city's green belt to each of its urban districts with a system of green rays connected by a network of cycle pedestrian um, paths like rays from the center. And then at each ray, our view, this is ray number one, was located in a particular area and they then did more finely grained kind of studies of what new connectivities should be uh, realized there. So they then, um, they had the idea that the voids, these so-called voids left by the departure of industry could become open-hearted spaces rather than just sort of enclaves that develop, narrow-minded developers might jump into and take um, a metrogramma's subsequent work for the municipality involved a very intense mapping and it led to the redefinition of the city and the city uh, traditionally had a hub and spoke type of plan, a universal wheel pattern um, which is not the only one in, in the whole of Europe. Um, what they d did was to create a lattice of 88 new neighborhood definitions based on their local, their research into the local areas. Um, and the idea was that these re would replace the nine former administrative zones built up over s centuries that they thought no, really, no longer f um, represented reality. And so they combined that with a layer of public transport system improvements um, with um, to in order to create much more of a easily accessible network interconnecting the whole city and its region in a more satisfactory and 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 generative way. And um, given that uh, up until that point there had been there are not that many commercial developers in Milan, but there's uh, Risanamento is one, and they made, had this noble attempt to, to regenerate one industrial area, Santa Giulia, commissioned Norman Foster. His master plan had a green lung, a uh, big park at the center, heart of by West Eight, the Dutch, master, Dutch landscape architects. But the plan did not get the equity it needed, and the municipality, which is already thinking, okay, we want to do this grand scheme for re, re, uh, rethinking the whole city. Um, we don't think these guys are going to make it, so we're going to take our plan for the new convention center out of Santa Julia. Um, and then all the building had to be halted because the equity was not coming in and 
the values of all the apartments just uh, sh uh, dropped down dramatically, and that's what it ended up looking like. Um, so there was the, really the reality of a lot of people getting their fingers burnt. Um, and this is hopefully something that um, mas master planning clients um, can try to avoid by, by doing things incrementally. And I know in London with King's Cross, with the Argent developers who are behind King's Cross, they deliberately tried to, have tried to do everything in phases and designers zonal master plan that allows for backing from a lot of different types of bodies together all at once. So uh, staying in Europe, another urban reconceptualization plan that also aims at generating a new type of urbanism is in a way a little bit similar, but at a multinational scale. Um, this is a big, a big in New York, the Dutch, um, uh, sorry, the Danish um, uh, architects and urban designers. But a few years ago, their Loop City proposal for Copenhagen um, looks back in time to the um, 1947 finger plan of the Danish urban designer Steel Isla Rasmussen, which was about reconnecting the suburbs to the center of the city. Loop City is a cross-border plan connecting Sweden and Denmark, which creates a ring of new light rail with 11 highly differentiated urban nodes around the Ur whole Urasand Ur region. And in total, that occupies the same space as the entire city. This ring is similar in size to the San Francisco Bay region. You can go on the internet and actually watch a very, very, very clear and very interesting video that they made about this. Um, and it includes work clusters around the ring and there are strategies for energy exchange, waste management, water treatment, electric car stations in this great big centerless metropolitan area. So it's envisaged as a focus for dense, sustainable, and recreational development of the whole region. Um, another riff on the notion of transport infrastructure, going back to Hawkins Brown and their and also think tank, is um, their future infrastructure. Right now, we have in London um, uh, an ambitious new 26 miles of new um, a uh, high frequency commuter railway com uh, railway lines being built currently under the under the city to improve connectivity for passengers living uh, slightly further out and underneath the Tottenham Court Road underground station which is near where i live um, hawkins brown came up with this um, a very fantastical subterranean world um, which you could call a master plan of a, of a kind So what further scope is there for creative intervention at the large scale that also takes care of the small scale? Land reclamation, of course, is one option. And um, say Semangium Island City by Architecture Research Unit in London, which is a huge 400 meter square meter land reclamation project on the west coast of the South Korean Peninsula. Um, is unprecedented in its scale amongst their projects. It's roughly two-thirds of the size of Seoul, the capital. And the site is intended to house um, nearly between 700,000 and, and up to a million people at densities of up to 60 dwellings um, per hectare near transport hubs and lower um, next to transport lines. It's a water city of coexistence and proximity of functions and programs. It's a 21st century concept, but it's not utopian uh, as a utopian tabula rasa um, building from scratch, but it's a city concept lacking single function zones. So in that sense, it goes against the grain of conventional Korean, Korean practices, which favor the zoning of the modernist city. 
but at the same time risk leaving out the critical sense of uh, conviviality that comes with diversity. So um, it's a big and complex scheme to explain very quickly, but in essence they proposed six new islands to be built within the freshwater lake behind the seawall. They stressed the relational aspect of urban spaces in their designs, um, which is sort of made solid uh, through a sense of spatial in-betweenness. So these islands are related in scale to um, water bodies that they have, uh, ARU, admired and photographed and scaled for use and viewing distance from within Europe not too big, and each one the width of, uh, well, walkable within 25 to 40 minutes. So they did, without doing the collage city cut and paste job, they chose from a number of city pieces. Um, this is comparing with London, which actually, if you, you need to know the size of London to, to have a, a real sense of it, but they chose a number of city pieces from various urban contexts. So ranging from the Dockland city block in Hamburg even allocated a period in history as well that they meant that they, they felt was meaningful. So the end of the 19th century going up to 1913, then the Thedar city block in Barcelona from the 1850s. These could be squares, they could be gardens, they could be um, streetscapes or skylines made up of buildings of similar type, flexible in use but not use specific. So it's within these that the city structures begin to deal with the uncertain future and evolving nature of the city. Um, so here there will be food industry clusters, for example, and they are often um, basically carried out in a very ad hoc way, um, and they just are developed and they somehow seemingly put down in a clumsy fashion. Um, and then these actually based on part of a university campus model that began in medieval times in Europe. For example, the courtyards and quadrangles of Cambridge in the UK. Whoops, uh, not so many pictures of what they're actually talking about, but you get the, you get the impression, I uh, get the sense of what I mean. Um, and uh, I guess in third hours, Barcelona block, it's not, not very hierarchical and it's got a lot of variety and they juxtapose it with a small grid devi deriving from the London Muse block, the Muse block being the block that includes um, uh, like a cul-de-sac where they have uh, like single story dwellings where originally the horses that uh, were used for the carriages had their stables. Um, so uh, the whole time the search is for a civility of space, spaces with a clear identity and also a sense of time and a sense of shared spaces. ARU also, like urban think tank, do not like master planning as a term because it's, they feel it's too definitive and it disregards the notion of the temporal. So to get around this, this they apply their design tools uh, more in terms of landscape infrastructure so landscape, they feel, is more a collective, uh, has a collective identity. It's somewhere that everyone can ideally feel happy in and free. And then infrastructure is very much about connecting the in-between. So I like the way they position themselves, and I think it has a lot to, to um, recommend it. Um, just a couple of more projects before I finish, and one is uh, you may have heard of Teddy Kruth, who's based in... Um, in San Jose, um, he's very much an adaptive ideas architect. Um, he mostly fo focuses on the micro scale of the neighborhood, which he calls the micro laboratory of the 21st century, on both sides of this uh, San, San Diego Tijuana border. He prefers to create instrumental concepts and what he calls scalable templates that are adaptive to the changing uses of space. He draws on existing physical and urban conditions and on patterns of occupation and interaction that he observes with f first hand that can rework the limits that are defined by rigid zoning and planning laws. Um, so instead of proceeding in his work in terms of purely of buildings per acre, he 
puts a priority on the idea of helping to generate economic, social and cultural transactions per acre. So in addition to providing a new type of affordable housing for the residents of San Isidro, uh, just north of the border, he, together with the NGO Casa Familia, sought to simulate, stimulate political, economic and social transformation by the means of monthly workshops with the public. So they discussed and challenged local conceptions of building density, um, of community, and what it was really focused on, on the notion of communal space, on financing models and so on, and in the process tried to redefine housing for different people, senior citizen housing, combining with child care facilities and so on, um, in order to incorporate alternative zoning categories relating to the city's density and citizens' income levels into the, plan the plans. So working with realities rather than working with abstract data and abstract, um, uh, abstract notions of what people really need. Um, and I think, I think these have a lot of potency as, as projects for many, many different contexts. Not that you would take this as a template and apply it in an identical way, but I just think that they are inspirational for other contexts. Um, South Africa, you know, uh, urban design has been carried out in South Africa for a number of years as part of the development of existing and new urban areas. Uh, after apartheid ended. And as a discussion, it was not really included or taken seriously um, in, the, in the restructuring of cities. As a result, the challenges of urban sprawl um, and of dormitory townships with huge areas for residential but not mixed use purposes are the everywhere present. And this is well after apartheid was ended. That Michael Hart is somebody that I picked up on and interviewed because he's a young, uh, very, very active, um, progressive urban design thinker and, um, and planner. And he is trying to change the system. Um, he told me that the theories of the American urban design thinkers like David Crane and Kevin Lynch and the work of the new urbanists have been influential there in triggering processes for mixed use uh, developments, helpful ways to integrate uh, people, uses, and lifestyles, and above all for more transport -oriented, public transport-oriented urban design, which is really vital because of the distances at which the workforces tend to live from the centers of cities. So one vehicle addressing a huge backlog of social housing needs has been the, the mixed-use Greenfield Cosmo City Extension 17 in Johannesburg. Now, Michael made the Lion Park framework plan as part of it, which has still not, it's not been realized yet, which challenged the prevailing standards for building suburbs, which in South Africa seem to dictate car-oriented planning in spite of the fact that car ownership is low and also neglect alternative energy solutions. And he's very keen to remedy these kind of, or stay away from these very blinkered approaches and get, and get away from also the classic notion of the piazza, which is uh, beloved by the local developers, in favor of something which is really genuinely more local. Um, what, is a relevant, what is a relevant space in such a context? It's not a, necessarily a piazza, which is borrowed from Italy, from, uh, from a previous era. So he's pushing for design-driven and not an en purely engineering-driven housing development uh, strategy, one which can then be used to create an infrastructure plan. And he wants to create densities without having high-rise developments as well. So through the application of the family of criteria that he devised himself without any uh, collaboration with the government, uh, social, economic, environmental design and engineering, uh, so called S-E-E-E-D-E, -E -E, matching to real demographics. His uh, precincts, as he puts it, are pedestrian friendly, they're mixed use, they're nodes that encourage a, a live-work environment, they're influenced by the 
Dutch concept of roadways shared with public spaces, which they, the Dutch call the Wunaf, um, li literally means living streets. Um, ena enabling social spaces for children to play, nighttime gatherings, um, talks, um, any kind of um, coming together of different people for different reasons, playing games and so on, with centrally placed parks uh, flanked by social and community buildings and row housing. And he avoids a potential isolating, sprawling tapestry of Mac Mansion type dwellings. So it was a real challenge for Hart to get the planning authorities to understand that, um, that car ownership in reality in this area is really very low. So the amount and the width of the roads should be changed to create a more pedestrian friendly environment. And, and no, nobody would be short changed if that happened because there are so few cars. And they're clinging on to the, the idea that they should develop it for car users. But they're not there. So he essentially is challenging this perpetuation of um, whole approach um, um, with its normative uh, aspects. Uh, and he says it's very hard to get the government to understand that the settlement also must be upgraded in an incremental way rather than just being uh, rather brutally demolished and placed elsewhere. He's also very sensitive to the existing communal networks set up between small businesses and houses that already exist in a more organic way, because a lot of people work for themselves, which is quite a common feature in formal settlements. People work for themselves. They, if they use materials, they recycle materials, they store those materials in their living, living spaces and so on. Um, so, his framework acknowledges the inability of the informal settlement dwellers to um, compete with the formal economy. And he proposes commercial and retail and trading facilities. So he's actually going out on a limb and creating whole new strategies for a program as well. Um, albeit this is speculative and has not yet been realized, including waste to energy businesses. So it, his Framework places activity spines close to related business hubs, which are also close to, to public transport, and has a mix of strategies to boost environmental capital, including urban agricultural schemes. So for a more recent plan for Slovo at the township of Coronationville in western Johannesburg, for which a major objective is the generation of employment, he addresses the needs of everybody from the informal sector, aligning urban markets with public space so that everyone is able to respond to the urban restructuring. And he ensures connectivity with neighboring suburbs and an orientation to pedestrian and cycle, cycling over car use. Um, all very la laudable objectives. So by way of uh, a quick summing up, because time is leaping on, I am just going to say a couple more things. Um, let's see. One more, voila, yeah, got it. <laughs> um, okay, so master planning, unlike Michael's work, which is speculative, master planning generally starts with clients, and clients aim to establish a prescriptive rule of set of spatial rules and codes as central to the master planning activity. But they increasingly value flexibility the capacity for change and speculative qualities to help build resilience. And it's this playoff, it's this dual um, perception, paradoxical and, and um, uh, contestatory scenario, which presents contemporary master planners with such a wealth of challenges to engage with and to reconcile. Now, some would say that the globally uneven advances made by neoliberalism um, and uh, an uh, urban theorist who's very astute, like Neil Brenner, who's based at Harvard GSD, 
Um, he reliably informs anybody who's interested in neoliberalism that it's now in its zombie phase. There's a very nice little pamphlet uh, on this whole topic. Um, he, some would say that the way the state of play now means that um, we have a lot of things, forces that are really antithetical to urban sustainability science right now in a way that needs to be practiced in the 21st century and translated in, in socio-spatial terms, responding to genuine needs for survival and, and the ability for the, the need for us to both survive and thrive everywhere. Um, so the dominance of transnational globalism and cities over-referencing each other as if some generalized copying and cloning would magically solve their urban growth imperatives. It leans attention away from, and resources away, from building locally situated planning activities and for, from building a capacity to identify either a city or a town's own personality and own tendencies rather than endeavor to be a universal idea of what, what they are. You know, city as brand, city as, city as utopia, city as fantastic concept where everything um, goes right and the sun never stops shining. Um, so the evolution of the master plan in the 21st century is not about the rigid blueprints of old, um, but it's about integrated loose fit frameworks designed as evolutionary generative systems. These possess adaptive capacities for the intelligent differentiation of place in a way that is aware and sensitive, aware of and sensitive to all the different layers of history, of memory, even in, in places where the history is, uh, is somehow under major threat. And my example's in China uh, it's not just uh, villages, but it's, you know, the hutongs in the old houses, row houses in places like Beijing. The tea houses in Chengdu were all under threat. If they happened to be in a development corridor, the developers going to get rid of them instead of cherish the fact that that's actually where people really want to meet and hang out and discuss the matters of the day. And why shouldn't they? So aware of community-focused desires and advance in a way that is consistent and represents reciprocity with community plans. And there are a lot more community plans now if you include all the schemes for urban agriculture and so on and so forth than there ever, there ever were, it seems. So they swap the impermeable knowledge silos um, that seem to be the way that things operated in master planning in the past for a more integrative, holistic, um, sensibility and, and thinking. And in this way, agency and framework can mutually inform each other, be resilient and beneficially interdependent, not weak and not dysfunctional. And this process is for me anyway, and this is everything I'm saying is me, uh, my personal view, is predicated on social equity and it calls for a, a transparency with, with full regard to local needs for inclusive housing, jobs, working spaces, and local amenities, including high quality, accessible green spaces, um, and overall environmental and economically sustainable strategies of benefit, benefit to all. And uh, that is um, my final word on the subject. So thank you very much for listening. Maybe not my final word on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think people are going to get so tired of talking about resilience yet. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like sustainability, well, and people are a bit uh, fed up with sustainability as a buzzword, but, and that's inevitable, you know, because things have their, become in vogue and so on, but I mean, how can we not carry on talking about resilience? Because the issues are just so major, aren't they? Um, I just think that we have the capacity now with the, the design digital tools allied with our, the way we see things 
to to be a lot more integrative in our thinking in a way that uh, that people never were before because they were so constrained by um, by by lots of um, uh, patterns and regulations and it's just a question of uh, what people really want to do and there are a lot of agendas obviously for um, things that uh, increase social inequality and the opportunities for rethinking how we live and everything is there are there trends where these are coming from new places that you know when you talk about top down mm -hmm. so much is coming from mm. disasters and just what do you see as the long term trends <laughs> um Well, that, that's actually what the British government would love the local, local people to do. They even introduced a new piece of legislation, the Lo Localism Act, and said, uh, you know, we are minimal, you know, we'd like to be non-interfering, we'd like us to be more minimal and light government. It's a, it's a common way of looking at government these days. And, and we would like to give you, the people, and uh, the scope to empower your own lives and so on. But meanwhile, they were making local government staff redundant, who could have been hugely beneficial in this process. Because I, I think there's a big drawback to, if you say to local community, communities, we'd like you to get on with it, but then you, you don't give them an awful lot of access to uh, guidance and skills. There are gr there are grants in the UK that you can you can get, um, um, but meanwhile there was a, a typical disconnect because they had a paradoxical policy of also at the same time asking the local councils to come up with plans each of them for the housing requirement for the next five six years because we need more housing in the UK and. Um, particularly in, in London, but also in other cities. So the requirement for each council to come up with their own, um, their own uh, area, action plan for housing, not just we have this number and this is the map and we'll dot them here and there and so on, but actually an integrated concept. Now, if the, those councils either were struggling to find the manpower to actually do that project, um, and they missed the deadline, then what happened and what has happened in many cases is that central government then jumps in and all planning permissions that are put in, all the planning applications put in by uh, local developers then get considered at a central level and then are subject to more generic criteria. It's almost like <laughs> they're, they're, it's a bit of a masochistic type of policy. They're not really enabling people to do what, what they're saying they would like to happen, which is a bit crazy making because it's... So people have to be inspired to see other examples of this in action. So yes. Right yeah. Um, I think, I mean, there is a limit to what local communities can do, although actually we've seen more, more people now setting up their own schools in the UK than ever before. Um, we don't really have a, we don't have labour conditions in the UK that allow people to have an awful lot of spare time to be setting up schools as an alternative to the education system, but but there are an awful lot of really really innovative community projects, and now that we have digital platforms, uh, you know the whole notion of using social media, the inf word can get out much more easily. People can feel involved much more easily. The boundaries are coming down. Any questions? Oh, yeah, question. Yes, yeah. So uh, I want to thank you for the interesting, spec a very wide spectrum of the different um, methodologies of approaching the, the team and the uh, designing and dealing with the urbanism today. So you, you talk about the fast growing city and the east of the world and the south of the world and this is very interesting to see mm. and all of these things on the same level 
and so it's 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 more interesting in the comparison what we are doing, right? Uh -huh. And the, uh, the kind of current world is this idea of crossing boundaries and uh, uh, holistic system and systemic approach, right? Mm -hmm. so which integrates different scales, different mm. issues together. There is a kind of problem when I'm in academia, and it's, there's a perfect world for that. But every time I deal with that in a kind of a professional world, there is a kind of a, um, uh, uh, obstacle in the way this design is intended because it crosses uh, often is a regional scale design or global scale design. So it deals with the natural ecological issues, water, soil, air, which are much bigger than the, the kind of a city uh, uh, board borders in some mm -hmm. way. But at the end, they have to be compared and deal with uh, political, administrative, and technical and rules which are city-oriented. And this is pretty frustrating every time because the proposals are, are dealing and try to um, uh, engage a complexity of issues which is not related just to a specific city or a specific mm. town. Mm. And uh, there is not kind of a, a, a real understanding of the needs and I want, I mean, to have your feedback about what do you think about the uh, um, possibility of this project to develop and to explore and to invent new strategies, new scale of dealing with the political boundaries. So I think this project, the, uh, the urban design project today, have to more and more trying to establish new methodologies, mm. new rules, new tools mm. to deal with these issues which are not urban and urban space, uh, built space related anymore. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with you because I think um, more pro progressive urban design strategies of the kinds that I've been describing, um, they beg the question, why is government govern governance um, carried out in the way that it is carried out? And, you know, these two are inextricable, although they're distinct, they, they all also somehow they're, they're dovetailed. Um, and and um, I think the more, the more in depth the research into the urban design, if it's a speculative project, um, the more you, uh, more designers actually naturally inclined to start questioning the status quo um, of of the way in which things are governed and why is that legislation here because if it was somehow adapted you know even in a small way there would be all these new possibilities um, and I, I think that there need to be probably more exhibitions and more debates and seminars and so on on these types of subjects to actually look at the art of the possible in a sense look at what actually can be done, um, um, and I, I just I know in the UK since that's the the culture that I know the the best that it does ultimately come down to the quality of the individual alliances. It's like if you have there are certain mayors who just get it. Um, we have a couple of mayors who trained architects, um, and uh, and one of them who was a former president of the Royal Institute of British Architects. So in a way that's perfect training ground for, for, for being a mayor of a city, um, somehow having more leverage to somehow get hold of some of those recalcitrant property developers, the ones who are sort of naive and think, yeah, it's fine to just roll out casinos and gambling halls all the time uh, in city centers. And they need they need to be somehow confronted, but at the same time enter you know be, have a space where they enter into dialogue, so they have the opportunity to learn about alternatives, so that they just don't carry on in their own kind of um, own blue sky thinking about what actually is going to guarantee their profit levels in the future. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> But it's um, it's a big question, absolutely, and um, there's an interesting in literature reference to the aesthetic of uh, formativity, which mm -hmm. is from which says we have to uh, invent a new way of doing why we are doing. Yeah, I think this it's a focus on process rather than on um, being obsessed with end result, which is what the original 
utopian city master plan was, you know, assemble all the, work out what you're going to do, assemble all the technical experts, and then implement it. And then the end result was also very viewed as being formalistic. So if it formalistically, aesthetically met the target, then that was fine by them. And it somehow was symbolically valuable rather than actually necessarily being valuable in a, in a wider, more holistic way. But the process, I think now is the time for, for people to be very, very creative about processes. Um, because the way that you do things, but just by changing the way that you do things, you radically change um, people's attitudes and you learn so, lo so much along the way as well, I think. That's why no, no I think no framework exercise is ever wasted. It's a way of getting from A to A to B, or it opens a lot of doors. Um, so that actually there are a lot of master planning projects going on in London at quite a, in a small, intimate neighborhood scale that somebody has commissioned. Um, and maybe they don't do a competition because that would be far too elaborate. They just ring up a couple of architects in, and invite them in and do, do, do an interview to see which one would be the most motivated. And then, then they get like a set fee. Um, and if uh, you know if the political process is right and there's some money, then it might end up going ahead in some f shape or form. But uh, in in a way, these processes are, are new because, let's say now in 2013, attitudes towards mixed use have changed, um, perceptions of um, connectivity and attitudes seemingly can are up for discussion a little bit more than perhaps they were and um, perhaps even people are less likely to be out you know are completely dismissive of any urban condition there was an awful lot you know that whole anti-suburban movement people were so anti-sprawl anti-suburbia suburbia um, but the fact is, a lot of people still do love living in suburbia, so why not consider changing certain aspects of suburbia to make it work for, for people, rather than saying, okay, it's bad, we've got to all live in the center of cities, which is actually not practical for a lot of people. It's just not affordable. Um, you spoke a lot about um, uh, developing cities and mega cities, but what about the shrinking city? Um, there are uh, lots of cities in the U.S. and even in Europe that are uh, shrinking in size. And how can uh, the urban designer or master planner address those issues? How can they contribute um, in those areas? Um, yeah, and I suppose, would, uh, would Detroit be one example in the States of a shrinking city? Yes. Yeah. Actually, that, that is a, one of the American cities, that, and there are many that I haven't visited. It's actually the study of a special issue of the Plan magazine, which is 50% about the Milan, the urban development plan. And then uh, the Metrogrammer, uh, two Italian guys, uh, also writing about Detroit, which they studied. And there are a number of schemes that have been going on in Detroit. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm not the best person to talk about a city like that, but I think that when you have an area which is really under threat and there's huge loss of jobs and it's somehow got to fight its way up from, you know, from that point and it's very vulnerable, I think people will have to think in terms of a, a very integrated master plan, which is about the incubation of, of startups or incubation of small businesses. 
uh, as I believe is happening in, in Detroit, and look at uh, what scope there is. Um, and it calls into question what the, the limits of the role of the architect are, because if, it, if, if you're working on a speculative level like Michael Hart, you can, obviously some of his work is obviously commissioned, but with regard to Lion Park, that was speculative, he, he, um, he can understand at a very profound level what it is the existing ecosystem of informal jobs is, what, it, what is there, and build on that. Um, he can make propositions to politicians, um, which they may not listen to at all at first. Um, so I, I think in those instances, the urban designer has to be as politically savvy as possible and somehow be easy at the idea of uh, gravitating and talking with a whole range of potential stakeholders. Um, if I think I mean, the centre of gravity in London is moving east in the sense that the bid for the Olympics was viewed as a, it was closely tied to this notion of legacy, giving East London, which is some of the poorest areas, not just in London, but in the whole of the UK, giving it a, leg, a real genuine legacy for the future and regenerating its districts. Um, it's, it's still not yet fully clear, because it's only been a year since the Olympics uh, finished, but it's not yet clear quite how, what the long-term effects will, will be in the, of the, the processes and the way it's been uh, adopted. Because there are still pockets that are, are really, really, really deprived. And, and also the Olympic Park scheme and the surrounding neighborhoods you've got to be aware the notion of the red line on the periphery of the master plan because what's really important is what's actually what what is the impact on the surrounding neighborhoods because if you bring one one particular area up and give it lots of new housing and lots of opportunities and you neglect the areas on either side you um I mean, this is one example, Oristat in Copenhagen, which was actually given the go-ahead by the government after they got new, it's a piece of linear city to the south of um, Copenhagen, um, which uh, is actually bordered by an area on the east side, which is actually one of the poorest areas of the whole, er uh, the whole region of Copenhagen. And it amazed me when I went there and interviewed the client uh, how little effort, no, there was no attention paid to that neighboring area. And, uh, and, I, and it, what, it worried me. I thought to myself, well, you know, this is going to be unfurled unfurl and it's going to look pretty good as a place to live. It's only four metro stops from the center. It's only 10 minutes of the ride. But what about all the people living on the other side? And I made the comparison with London thinking of the, the neighboring boroughs to the immediate Olympic Park, which include Haringey and Walthamstow and so on and so on, that dearly, dearly need, need help as well. Because um, we have, uh, you know, there are areas where, you know, the, where a lot of the gangs reside and somehow these kind of social, social issues have to be dealt with it at a more fundamental level through initiatives. Um, our, ma our mayor is conservative and he believes in the Thorsten Veblen concept of trickle down. He doesn't believe in implementing big taxes on the companies coming to London because he's worried that he'll put them off, um, that they will suddenly think, no, I don't want to invest in London which I think is unlikely because London's a kind of hot place to, to, to be located. Um, but I remember when he made his, his speech for election, his campaigning speech, he said, you know, it's going to trickle down. We don't want to put them off. The wealth will come and then it will trickle down. Uh, I don't agree with that. I think it has to be uh, somehow there have to be policies that enable things to happen. Um, he... Uh, he went and visited a boxing club and he said, this is so great, this is turning the lives of young people around. Um, I think what would be great is to have a whole network of boxing clubs so we can thereby, we can give young people 
uh, new facilities. We can give them, we can give scope to entrepreneurs to run the clubs and so on and so forth. And this, he went on record as saying this, and none of this happened. The guy who ran the original boxing club that he saw really um, kept it going. But there was no network urbanism on the part of Boris Armeyer. And, um, and then a year before the riots, um, 13 youth clubs got closed down um, in three different East London boroughs. That's 13 youth clubs got closed down. Um, and I think if I'd been an urban designer uh, rather than <laughs> what I do, which is somehow um, maybe not actually sitting down and sketching and drawing, um, I would have loved a few years ago to try to make some sort of system where you had um, an existing structure of, of businesses way, way before the Olympic bid. Um, but it is, it is an irony that often cities, they wait for the opportunities like the Olympics and then they pounce on it and they try very hard to bid for it and hope that it will turn around the fortunes of their city. And, uh, and as history has shown us, often it, it, it doesn't. Or it's going to take a long time. It's a very expensive means. This is all work that should be ca carried out anyway. Um, so I think there's probably a role now, and, and in, in London we can see there are new, newer agencies. They're not necessarily NGOs, but there are these smaller agencies that work very much. They, they, they have competitions for particular neighborhoods. They work with local people, so they practice participate, participatory placemaking. Um, they're very interested in micro-businesses. Um, they, uh, uh, they're social entrepreneurs, so they, they look to convert buildings so that people can ha have startup units and so on. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, the one thing I can do, I can do is write about people like that and give them more exposure. Um, as for the architects, well, it's, it's kind of hard to know what they can do because it does beg the question, what's the limit? What is the, the limit of the respons their responsibilities? Well, I think we, we're going to move to the reception. <laughs> yeah. It's 8.30. I thank yeah. you so much. That was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.